Hi, I'm David Booth with the Yosemite Project. Today's webinar is the fourth in our latest series on the Yosemite Project, whose mission is to achieve semantic interoperability of all structured healthcare information. The Yosemite Project articulates an ambitious roadmap for achieving interoperability based on the use of RDF as a universal information representation. Today's presentation by Josh Mandel and me fits into the left-hand portion of the roadmap on standardizing the standards. By defining a standard RDF representation for FHIR, we can begin to link FHIR data with data that is represented using other standards. Josh is a physician and software engineer at Children's Hospital Informatics Program at Harvard MIT, and he's been heavily involved in the development of FHIR at HL7. He's also did a lot of early work on developing an RDF representation of FHIR which this presentation is based on. And as a reminder, if anybody has a question during the presentation, we will have a Q&A portion at the end. Uh, so if you want to submit a question, just email it to me. Here's the email address. And I will try to pick it up from my email and uh, read it out. So welcome, Josh. Well, thanks very much, David. And what I'd love to do is give you a quick introduction to some of the thorny problems in healthcare workflows and talk about the emerging FHIR specification, well, what it is, what it does. And I'll give you a tour of the FHIR website along the way to help orient you to some of the key parts. And that will set us up really nicely to begin understanding the RDF representation of FHIR, which is a key component in the roadmap that David just shared. So broadly speaking, what are the problems in this domain of, of healthcare workflows? Uh, and they are many, uh, and it includes everything from patients trying to communicate with clinicians to communications between hospital systems, between hospitals and clinics. How do I refer a patient uh, from my primary care practice out to a cardiology practice uh, in a way that the cardiologist knows why the patient is showing up on the door? Uh, and in a way that when the patient is sent back to me in my primary care practice, I know what the cardiologist has recommended. Uh, that's a basic referral workflow. Uh, we can talk about clinical decision workflows that could take place on a very small time scale. So I'm in the process of prescribing a new medication to treat high blood pressure, and I want to know whether this prescription that I'm about to write is actually the best choice according to the most recent guidelines. Um, and that's a decision support problem where informatics and tools uh, can really help. Uh, or operationally, if I'm trying to understand whether my hospital or my clinic is providing the best quality care across a population of patients, how can I calculate metrics that are going to be comparable to those that can be computed elsewhere so I can understand um, in absolute terms as well as in relative terms, the quality of care that I'm delivering. Uh, and then there are numerous research use cases, anything from designing a clinical trial to generating new hypotheses uh, about treatments or medications uh, or behavioral changes um, to run-of-the-mill financial transactions, like figuring out whether a particular patient uh, is eligible for a kind of a care or a treatment procedure or a medication underneath their insurance coverage. All these use cases, uh, and many more, need liquid, well-structured data in order to support the kinds of modularity of services uh, that we need in the ecosystem. Uh, and that's a big set of problems, but I want to describe the emerging FHIR or fast healthcare interoperability resources specification, uh, which is not going to solve all of those problems, but is a useful building block uh, when we think about creating solutions to, to many of these problems. So FHIR is currently what's called a draft standard in the HL7 world. HL7 is the health level seven. It's the international standards development organization for healthcare standards. And uh, one of the most important things to understand about FHIR upfront, before you even know any, anything about what it is and what it does, uh, is the fact that it's an open standard and it's made available under a Creative Commons Zero license which effectively is as close to public domain as you can get. Um, so the important point about FHIR is anyone can use it for whatever purposes they want. Uh, and you can take it and you can extend it and modify it. You can't call your new thing FHIR, but that's about the only limitation on what you can do with FHIR. Uh, so it's very much wide open. And what it provides are a number of core building blocks for interoperable healthcare workflows. Uh, the central building block is a set of what FHIR calls resource definitions. So FHIR breaks the world of healthcare down into a set of resources, which are intuitive, everyday concepts for the most part, like 
uh, a patient or a healthcare practitioner or a medication prescription or a, a lab result. Those are examples of the kinds of things that are represented in FHIR resources. And FHIR provides a kind of a modeling paradigm built in everything from a basic set of data types to um, larger aggregations of these data types uh, into small clusters of information, uh, all the way down to value sets. So when we say that a medication has a code telling us what drug it is, FHIR value sets uh, provide a way to, to limit that universe of codes to something that's well-defined. And in addition to these building blocks, FHIR provides out of the box an API for interacting with data that are stored in a FHIR server. So you can just treat FHIR as a set of data models, or you can treat FHIR as a way to store and expose healthcare data between systems. And the REST API, uh, which I'll give you a tour of, uh, provides that kind of hook point. Uh, so many of these concepts, especially the notion of resources and links between resources, are very well aligned with a semantic web. Uh, FHIR was not designed uh, with the semantic web as its core guiding principle per se, uh, but we'll see that many components of FHIR align really well with what we want to do in RDF. Uh, there are also some components of FHIR that you might think you wouldn't need in a world where uh, RDF had existed from the beginning. Uh, and so from that perspective, you might think that FHIR has reinvented some, some pieces of the ecosystem, uh, but this is often how standards development happens. So at a very high level, I'll just describe a little bit about what some of the FHIR resources are. and um, this is an interesting time in the history of FHIR because we are just on the cusp of publishing the second draft of the FHIR specification in which there will be about 100 resources, so these sort of um, atomic structures that you would want to communicate back and forth between systems. And FHIR puts them into a few large buckets. So there's a bucket called administrative resources, which has to do with things like patients and hospitals and floors within a hospital, uh, healthcare practitioners, so the clinicians, those are all administrative resources. Uh, and then there's a bucket of clinical resources, which are things like meds and problems and labs and allergies um, and all those kinds of basic clinical data. Uh, there's a category I haven't listed here, which is new in FHIR called fi financial resources, which has to do with things like claims and eligibility workflows. And then there's a, a bucket called infrastructure resources, which I'll talk about just a little bit, uh, because FHIR comes with a built-in set of modeling tools, and the infrastructure resources are what support those modeling tools. So the first thing I should say about FHIR is, um, unlike many standards in the healthcare world, you can Google it. Uh, if you type FHIR into Google, you actually get um, the first hits are about FHIR, and the, the very top hit here is the FHIR specification itself, which is a great thing. Uh, and it seems trivial, but if you try to work with a lot of standards in the healthcare world, uh, you'll know that they're not that easy to find or to view. Uh, but this is actually the first draft of FHIR, and I want to show you the bleeding edge. So I'm going to click on the directory of versions, and I'm going to go to the word that says current here, which is our continuous integration build um, toasted on GitHub pages. And it, every time there's a new commit to the FHIR spec, uh, this page here gets updated. So just to show you the list of resources, I'll click on the resources button here. And we'll see, as I mentioned, there's about 100 resources described here. And I'll click on one just to give you a sense of, of what these resource definitions contain. So I'll click on the patient resource and scroll down to the actual set of definitions. This is the content of the resource. It's labeled at the top of the screen here as resource content. And we can see a patient, for example, has the following fields. A patient has a name, and you can have zero or more names. That's what zero to star here means. A patient has a gender, which you could have either zero or one of in this model, and a birth date, which again is zero or one birth dates per patient. So those are some basic aspects of patient demographics that you'd expect to find in any system. And you know, scrolling down the list, we could include photographs of a patient. We can include contacts like next of kin uh, that we might need to get in touch with, um, as well as the patient's communication preferences and a list of who provides care for them. Um, and that list of who provides care is an important thing for me to highlight because we don't put the doctor uh, all the doctors identifying information right here in the patient resource. We don't say it's Dr. Jones who works at this practice, whose phone number is such and such. Instead, we provide a link or a reference to the practitioner. And so FHIR is built on this notion that resources reference other resources. In this case, we would reference a practitioner resource. And by clicking here in the spec, we can see the spec itself is a web of resource definitions, just like a FHIR server itself is a web of resource content. And so the structure of the specification mirrors the structure of real-world data that are expressed in FHIR. 
So that's a quick tour of, of the way that FIRE defines uh, these resources. And if you look under the hood, if you really want to sort of peel back the layers here, we can see that the FIRE specification itself defines all of these resources. The data models themselves are written in terms of another resource in FIRE, which is called a structure definition. Structure definition is one of these infrastructure or meta modeling components of FIRE, which allows you to define resources. So it tells you, for example, there is a structure called patient, which has fields called name and birth date. That's what structure definition is used for. That's a very quick tour of the FIRE spec. And with that, I want to say a little bit about the low level representation of data and then show you a couple quick examples of the REST API. So all of the FIRE examples that I showed you, a patient, for example, has a name and a birth date. Each of those has a well-typed data field. Name in FIRE uh, would be a string, and birth date would be a date time. And this set of data types are used to define all those granular data structures. So that's a little bit about how resources are defined. Let's see some instance data in the context of a FIRE REST API call. So for example, if I'm talking to a FIRE server, I can say, get me all the patients whose name is Amy. Uh, and that's a REST API call. It's a get to the slash patient endpoint. And I provide one query parameter called name equals Amy. And I'm pointing to a sandbox server that we host uh, at the smart platform site at Harvard Medical School. And we don't have a lot of sample data, but we've got about 50 sample patients of whom uh, four have the string Amy in their names. And if I scroll down, I'll see data that matches the model I showed you a minute ago. So each patient, for example, has a name. You can see this, this person is named Amy Shaw and a gender, which in this case is female, and a birth date, and so on. So that's the serialization of FIRE data in JSON. FIRE comes with built-in support for serializing data in JSON, uh, as well as in XML. And so we can see exactly the same patient resource represented both ways using content type negotiation with the FIRE server. I just say, I want to accept JSON, or I want to accept H uh, XML, and I'll get what I want. One of the things we're working on is an RDF-based representation as well, which David will talk through in more detail. Just a couple more examples to show you on the REST API, something a little bit more interesting. I could search, for example, for a patient's lab results if I know the type of lab I'm interested in, um, or a patient's vital signs. So in FIRE, lab results and vital signs are both examples of one, one resource called observation. Uh, and each observation has a, a code associated with it. In this case, um, we'd use a LOINC code. LOINC is a coding system that's used for, uh, for observations across um, the healthcare ecosystem. And I forgot to update my query to fire draft two here. Uh, the field changed from being called name to being called code. So by fixing that, now I get just the blood pressure readings out. And if I scroll through the results here, you'll see that each one consists of a blood pressure reading, which has a systolic value and a diastolic value. So that's the way that you can hone in on just the resources that you're interested in. Um, and the last thing I'll show you are a couple more examples of more advanced usage of the REST API. So I just showed you how to get all blood pressure readings across all the patients in a system. But I can also do something that FIRE calls chaining to say, get me all the blood pressures about women, female patients in the system. And in that case, I can say, specify the observation code and also specify that the subject.gender equals female. So FIRE provides out of the box a little bit, a few elements of a graph search API. Uh, it's quite limited in terms of its expressivity, but it lets you do some interesting things uh, like filtering down results based on the things that they are linked to. And it also allows you to fetch um, some of those things as well. So if I query for observations about patients who are female, I can add to my query a parameter called include to actually get the patient demographics back as well. So I can say, give me the observations and also give me the patients. Again, it's not completely expressive, but it's a pretty good starting point. Let me say, give you one more example of one of the fire infrastructure resources. Uh, and here's one called value set. And this is a resource that you could use if you were creating um, within fire, uh, let's say a, a new workflow for doing referrals. And you might wanna have a, a code attached to your referral that says, why am I referring this patient to the cardiologist? And you wanna express that in a coded way. Well, you could leave that totally open for people to stick any code they wanted in that slot. Or you could say, I want you to use one of the following five codes. And that's called a value set. And so here's an example uh, in FIRE of what a value set looks like. You can publish a value set as, as text for a human being to read to see here's four codes in my value set. But under the hood, this is actually represented in a structured way. 
with a fire resource called value set. And I can view uh, that structured resource as well. And this is the, the JSON expression of the value set. And so the idea is these infrastructure components are computable as well. And this is all a big help when we think about representing fire in RDF, because it's not just our instance data that could be represented in RDF, uh, but it's all of the definitions as well. And that's really powerful because we can query against our instance data and our definitions in one common object store. Final point in fire is extensibility. So in the models that I showed you, a patient had a field called name and a field called birth date, um, but a patient did not have a field called favorite color. And the reason for that is you know, pretty simple. Favorite color is not really a common, important part of what's stored in your medical record. Um, but how do we know that name belongs there and favorite color doesn't? Well, FHIR provides kind of a, an 80-20 principle, a rule of thumb that says if, if most systems, if 80% of systems support an attribute on a given resource, then we'll put it into our model. Um, but anything else doesn't go into the model. And instead, you can express it if you want to using an extension on the patient or on any any node of any resource that you care about. So extensions can go pretty much anywhere in FHIR, and they allow folks to layer on additional meaning that's not included in the core resource definitions. And there's a couple of subtleties here that we'll get into when we talk about the RDF representation of FHIR. In general, extensions are a great fit for the semantic web and RDF model, where anyone can say anything about whatever they want. Uh, but FHIR tries to catalog extensions into two categories up front. So if I'm defining an extension, I can say whether it is a quote unquote modifier extension or not. And if it's a modifier extension, it means this is really important. If you don't understand this extension, you shouldn't be trying to interpret this resource uh, because it modifies the meaning of the whole resource. So you can notice that there's a modifier extension present. And if you know you, you don't know that extension, then you have to just leave the resource alone and say, I don't know what to do here. Uh, on the other hand, other extensions like favorite color don't change the meaning uh, of the resource at all. They just give you a little bit of additional information. And so FHIR tries to defi define this distinction between extensions and modifier extensions so we know what is and is not safe for automatic processing. And that will have interesting implications when we think about the RDF representation of FHIR. So with that, let me turn the presentation back over to David, who will take us through uh, what are some of the current best practices around representing FHIR in RDF and some of the emerging trends. OK, thanks, Josh. And hopefully, you're now seeing my screen. Um, so what is FHIR RDF? Um, well, FHIR has already defined two formats for representing FHIR data. One is an XML-based format, and the other is a JSON-based format that uh, Josh has talked to you about. Um, one of the interesting things is that both of those formats are equivalent in terms of the information that they carry. So in other words, if you transmit some FHIR data in the XML format or in the JSON format, you're really sending the exact same information. And there are lossless translations between them that are already defined, and you can download uh, uh, reference implementations for converting between them. Uh, Fire services will also know how to speak both of those formats. So basically what we're doing with Fire RDF is we are adding a third format, an RDF format, and specifically using the turtle syntax. And a key aspect of this, of this is that it needs to be round trippable, losslessly round trippable between the XML and the JSON formats so that you can, again, freely go between any of these formats without any loss of information. So that has some important implications, uh, which I'll get to in a, in a second. Uh, but first of all, why are we interested in FHIR RDF? Well, ultimately, of course, it's to improve healthcare, uh, clinical care and research, and uh, to be able to verify data quality better. But um, it fits into this, this uh, overall uh, Yosemite Project roadmap in the standardize the standards part. It's part of, of representing this standard, uh, FHIR, uh, using RDF as a universal information representation. And a nice thing about doing that is that that makes it easier to uh, link between standards using RDF as that common semantic basis and also link data together, instance data, that has been represented using standards. It's also good for automating some inference and allows you to do some then very sophisticated queries that might involve data from multiple sources. So those are kind of the reasons why we're interested in doing this. Now, 
the current FIRE RDF project is a joint HL7 and W3C effort uh, under a subgroup called RDF for Semantic Interoperability. It started in November of last year, and ultimately it will be validated uh, by the HL7 organization as part of the, the FIRE specification. But uh, just to give credit here, it builds on a, a quite a bit of early work that Josh Mendel and Eric Prudomo and others had already been doing uh, unofficially uh, to develop a fire, a, an RDF representation of fire. So a uh, key goal is to be able to automatically uh, generate this, um, these conversions between fire XML or fire uh, JSON and have it be a simple transformation. There's a link there that actually goes to Josh's uh, GitHub repository for doing this. And to have it pre be uh, comprehensive so that any fire message, any valid fire message, can be freely trans uh, translated between these different formats. And eventually, we would like the produced RDF to look nice, um, to be uh, represented uses, using an ontology that is relatively reason uh, reasonable to read, uh, and that also supports reasoning. And that is a key element, uh, especially. So let me show you a little bit of what Fire RDF would look like. I'm starting off here on the left with some Fire in the XML format. And this is just a, an example that I downloaded from the HL7 website. I, I uh, elided portions of it just to make it fit on the screen here. But it's an observation. It's a, it's a um, weight uh, observation. And apparently, somebody's weight was 185 pounds in these units of measure as pounds. And it's represented also using a LOINC code of 3141-9, which means that this is the weight measured. So how would that look in Fire RDF? Well, here's what it would look like. And if you look at the correspondence here, it actually looks fairly similar. Uh, let me go through some specific parts of it. First of all, overall, what we're seeing here is an RDF object, which is called fire colon observation. And that corresponds to this overall XML on the left of an observation that was transmitted. So that's pretty good correspondence there. Now, um, in general, the attributes and the elements within the XML will become properties within the RDF. But one little thing is that RDF doesn't have any notion of nesting. Uh, XML uses nesting very heavily so that the semantics of something that is nested inside something else depend on that nesting. So for example, code on the left here in the XML, the meaning of that term code depends on the fact that it's nested inside observation. So really we would refer to that term as observation.code uh, in a fully qualified form. So in the on the right, when we want to express this in RDF, we actually need to use a fully qualified property, or at least that is uh, the way we've decided to do it in order to simplify our work. Uh, next is the, the values that um, are expressed inside a code on the left in XML. Uh, the XML, uh, excuse me, the, the FHIR specification says that the value of that code element has to be a an instance of uh, a codable concept. Codable concept is a data type that's defined in FHIR. So on the right-hand side, we're saying that this instance of, of, of an observation code is a, an instance of a codable concept. And uh, so the range of the code property is a codable concept. So again, fairly good correspondence there. The property then of the uh, the coding property on the left here uh, in the fire xml then corresponds to a coding property on the right but this time it's qualified by the name of that data type the uh, codable concept which has become a class in uh, rdf and again that's in order to fully qualify that property name because the term coding in theory could be used for different purposes in fire but specifically, we're talking about the purpose here as a property of the codable concept. And next, 
uh, we have the coding as a class here. Again, this corresponds to the range uh, or the type of a coding element in fire. So a coding element in fire has to have or a coding inside it. And then we have the various properties of coding. And here's an illustration of the uh, of a value, a, a, a URI. Uh, so URIs come across from XML to RDF very nicely. Uh, in XML, it's just represented as a quoted string. In RDF, we'll represent them, them as, uh, as RDF uh, URI objects. And literals come across nicely as well. Um, a simple string on the left uh, for a code value would be represented on the right also as a string. But in general, we will want to attach data types to them uh, because uh, in RDF, you can make the data types explicit uh, attached to the literal value. And we pick up the data type from the, uh, the schema for the code value that that code value is required by the, uh, the Fire XML to be actually of type code. So it corresponds to the RDF type of code as well. So you can actually try this out using a Fire XML to RDF translator. Uh, this is a, an interesting piece of code that is on the web that uh, you can try running. It was developed by Eric Prudomo and Josh Mandel. Uh, it's not done yet in the sense that it will continue to evolve as we go along and make more decisions about how we want to represent things uh, in Fire RDF. Uh, but you can try it out. And let me show you how you can actually try this. So first of all, you can find some Fire XML that you want to translate. Uh, it, this one uh, expects that you're going to go from Fire XML to RDF. And so as an example, you could go to the the Fire, the HL7 website and follow through there and look for any of the uh, XML examples of Fire that you want to pick up. Here's one. Uh, this is one for an observation. And then you want to grab the URL for the raw XML uh, of this Fire. Uh, so if you look on the page, then you can click on raw XML, then it'll pop up window uh, and it'll display that XML, and typically it'll try to render it in a particular way. But if you view source, you will see that you actually have the raw XML. So if you just copy that, uh, that URL for the raw XML, then go to the URL for the translator, which is an online translator here, and here's the URL for it, and paste your XML URL into the first field at the top of the translator form. And that's probably all that you'll need to do. You probably don't need to change any of the other values in there in order to see this work. Just click on the Submit button, and then what you should get is your Fire RDF result. And this is, in fact, uh, the Fire RDF result that I was just showing you uh, when I showed excerpts of the Fire RDF. So um, the the definition of, uh, of Fire RDF is not, has not always been uh, straightforward. There are some things that are challenges uh, that mostly arise out of the fact that Fire was not designed with RDF in mind. And, and Josh alluded to this a moment ago. Um, the, you know, most of the users are going to be focused, uh, at this point anyway, on Fire XML and uh, Fire JSON. So uh, the RDF version of Fire just kind of has to trail along and catch up uh, as best we can at the moment, anyway. And so one of the general challenges that we have to face is the round tripping. We have to be very careful to retain all of the information that is uh, potentially needed in Fire XML or Fire JSON in the RDF format, uh, even though you wouldn't naturally uh, need to want to keep it there. Okay, another one of the challenges is extensibility. Um, and in Fire, almost everything is extensible. And here's a little example of a birth date. You know, you could just give a simple birth date, with it, which is the year, month, and, and day, but you could also add an extension on that. And maybe this is an extension, for example, that says uh, how many days old a person is or whatever. 
that can be stuck into the Fire XML. That's a permitted part of the Fire XML. And this has ramifications for the Fire RDF. And the way we have addressed this in the Fire RDF is to introduce some extra blank nodes. So where in Fire XML, if even if you had a simple case without an extension, in the Fire RDF, we will have an extra blank node in there instead of directly just saying, hey, the birth date is this string, we are introducing this extra blank node with an extra uh, additional value property. Oops, sorry, that should say fire colon value there. And the reason is because everything is potentially extensible and we wanted to uh, treat them in a, uh, in, a, in a uniform way, not treat some cases in one way and other cases in another way. So another case that poses a challenge is uh, is monotonicity. Um, fire the the fire I'm sorry the RDF semantics essentially requires monotonicity, and when I say monotonicity, I mean that if you uh, add new assertions to a set of uh, a set of RDF, you don't cause the old conclusions that are naturally derivable from that RDF to be invalidated. Okay. And that's an important property to maintain in RDF. But the problem is that there are a couple of features of fire that naturally speaking would be considered non-monotonic. And one of those is uh, the modifier extensions that Josh mentioned. And another is uh, this uh, status code called, uh, sorry, this code called status, uh, where one of the cases that you could put in one of the values you could put in, for example, might be, you could say that this was entered in error, which is essentially invalidating that particular uh, observation. So if we look at the modifier extensions, a modifier extension can in fact negate what you would otherwise consider the, the statement that that thing is making. And an example of this is an anti-prescription an anti-prescription is telling a patient to not take a medication. Don't take that medication. And so if we look at this XML for a, a medication order, normally we would think of this as representing a medication order, and we would think that normally it would have the, the semantics of a medication order. But because this has a, modif a modifier extension saying this is an anti-prescription and its value is true, it in fact is not a medication order. It's telling the patient to not take that. So how can we address this in RDF? Well, one potential option, uh, we haven't formally decided this yet, but one of the potential options we are considering is to make RDF capture just the structure of the fire instance, not the semantics directly. So in other words, if this translates into the following RDF that says M1 is a fire medication order and there's a modifier extension, et cetera, and it says anti-prescription, well, this does not mean that M1 is actually a real medication order. It just means that this is what was expressed in the fire XML. And by that modifier extension, in fact, it turns out that it, it doesn't actually represent semantically a, a real medication order. So this is one of the potential ways to deal with it. Another uh, challenge that we ran into was uh, about element ordering. Uh, in Fire XML, the order of repeated elements might be semantically significant. It is allowed to be semantically significant. So for example, if we had an observation and there were a couple of codings for it, one using the LOINC uh, terminology and one using SNOMED terminology, the fact that the LOINC one was listed first maybe indicates that that's a preferred one or, or whatever. Um, the point is that that ordering has to be preserved in the RDF representation somehow in order to achieve uh, round tripping with full fidelity. So RDF is not naturally ordered in any way. So we needed to find some way of capturing that ordering. And the solution that we decided on was to add an explicit index property to the fire RDF that's generated. So uh, it explicitly indicates, for example, that this LOINC one was the first one and the SNOMED one was the second one. Now, 
the Fire XML instance data is described using uh, XML schemas and, of course, the Fire spec as well. So you can think of the XML schema as being as defining the structure, the syntactic structure of Fire XML. Similarly, when we talk about Fire RDF, the there is a Fire ontology uh, that we are developing that defines not the syntactic structure of RDF because RDF doesn't care about syntax; it just cares about the semantics. So the Fire ontology is is uh, then defining the classes and properties of that Fire RDF instance. And the way this will work in terms of uh, connecting it with other ontologies in the world, say uh, other ontologies representing other terminologies, is that the Fire ontology, uh, and let's take SNOMED CT as an example, um, the Fire ontology would not have any SNOMED CT specific knowledge built into it. And the reason for this is that fires simply cannot know about all of the terminologies in existence because people can just invent new ones all the time. Now, on the other hand, uh, the SNOMED CT ontology doesn't have any uh, fire specific knowledge. So thus far, initially, these things are sort of disconnected. So the third thing that, that we are uh, counting upon is that there will be a fire to SNOMED CT bridge ontology that would then know both about the fire ontology and the SNOMED CT ontology and would then would connect the two together. Okay, so uh, if we had these things, then we could accomplish, excuse me, we could accomplish when we put them all together, some useful inference by making all those semantic connections between them. And so here's a little example of some fire instance data then. And notice there's a, a, a SNOMED CT code here uh, specified. The value is 906.14001. And it's saying that the coding system uh, was uh, based on SNOMED. And that corresponds to a code in the SNOMED CT ontology, that 906.14001. That, in turn, uh, is defined to be a subclass of some other uh, class in that SNOMED ontology. And that, in turn, is defined to be a subclass of some other class. And, and there might be a number of levels of subclassing, that sort of thing. But finally, then, it's uh, defined to be a subclass of 37387305 of that class in the SNOMED ontology. So now the bridge ontology needs to make a connection between the fire ontology and the SNOMED CT ontology. So it, in fact, defines this notion called substance code, which exists in the fire ontology, and it connects it then with that code, with that class in, that came from the, the SNOMED CT ontology. And this is how they all get connected together then. There is in the fire ontology that uh, that class called uh, substance code. Okay, now the, the fire ontology thus far is not linked to any sort of higher ontology. It is really just describing the classes and properties directly uh, in fire RDF, and it doesn't link to, say, an upper ontology. There are a couple of activities that, uh, that are underway right now to help connect FHIR uh, to other ontologies. Uh, there's a, uh, an ontology workshop, a clinical translations uh, ontology workshop to be held in Charleston, South Carolina uh, next week. Barry Smith and others are involved in that. And so one of the possibilities, for example, is to connect FHIR RDF ontology to the, uh, the BFO, which is, stands for Basic Formal Ontology, I think it stands for. Another one possibility is uh, OGMS, which stands for uh, Ontology of General Medical Systems, I think it is. And those are links, by the way, if you want to click on them. And then there's also a project, another project at H HL7 that is working on defining computable links, in other words, RDF links from FHIR to the existing HL7 RIM. The, the HL7 RIM is the reference implementation model that
that has previously described uh, semantics of uh, things in the HL7 world. And that effort is starting out with uh, the pharmacy. Uh, there's already in the fire specification uh, informal links described in English prose. So the, the goal here with this effort is to express those informal links in RDF, uh, either using OWL, SCOS, some combination, or potentially something else. And that effort is just, just started off a couple of weeks ago. So here are some links if you'd like to follow up further about this. And now it's time for questions and comments. So I invite anybody to uh, email questions to me at david at dbooth.org. And let me take a look at any questions that we have so far. Uh, let's see. OK, first question. Would all healthcare providers have to convert to using the RDF version of FHIR in order to get the benefits of using FHIR RDF? Uh, the answer is no, because any of the FHIR formats, XML or JSON, uh, can be converted to any of the other formats, right? So uh, it really doesn't matter what format different people are using, you can convert it into Fire RDF and then get the benefits of using Fire RDF. Uh, next question Does Fire RDF also define Fire RDF services? Uh, no, it doesn't. The, the, the fire spec does define services, but those are the same services regardless of what uh, format you are using, uh, whether it's XML or JSON or RDF. And another question is, fire RDF connected to the HL7 RIM? Uh, yeah, I just addressed that actually. It's not yet connected anyway. Uh, but that is, uh, there is work going on about that. And let's see, general question, uh, how can I participate in the FHIR RDF effort? Yeah, the, there is a teleconference uh, each week on Tuesdays at 11 Eastern. And uh, if, feel free to email me and I can send you uh, more information about it. And let's see. Okay, that seems to be all the questions we have right now. Uh, Josh, would you like to make any other uh, comments? Not at this time. I've enjoyed the opportunity to talk through FHIR and RDF. Okay, great. So um, I'll just bring people's attention to upcoming webinars. We have a couple of more webinars uh, scheduled in this series. And uh, then uh, I'll just say thank you very much, Josh. Um, for uh, all the work that you've done on this and for uh, defining, for participating today. And thanks to all of our listeners for participating. And if you have any follow-up questions, then feel free to email them to, either to Josh or to me or both. Thank you all and goodbye. Thanks everyone, take care.